attributes exemplify the important inclusion of the 20th century architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright as a World Heritage Site. The attribute that most clearly defines Unity Temple is the creation of an architecture responsive to functional and emotional needs through geometric abstraction and spatial manipulation. Dynamic forms employ innovative structural methods and inventive use of new materials and technologies. The aesthetic intent and structure is united through the early use of a single material, reinforced concrete. The spatial continuity is expressed through the open plan and blurred transitions between interior and exterior spaces, as observed through the entry from the terrace to the lobby, as well as the abstracted forms of nature viewed on the exterior column capitals through geometric clear story windows, essentially integrating nature from the outside in. The richness of experience is created through carefully composed paths of movement, revealing contrast between light and dark, solid and void, compression and release. The nature of Unity Temple's groundbreaking use of reinforced concrete is an early example of béton bruette, a French term that is used to describe raw concrete that is left unfinished after being cast. The exterior geometric shapes and cubic forms are reinforced on the interior by patterns with thin oak strips that weave together cubic volumes, piers, balconies, and ceiling through continuous and dynamic patterns while amber art glass skylights wash the interior, unifying the whole. Unity Temple was designed for a Unitarian congregation, emphasizing Wright's understanding of the importance of human nature in discovering religious truths. It was a radical break from long-standing Western notions and conventions of religious architecture. Unity Temple is an icon of the modern architectural movement and is widely considered to be Wright's most important contribution to modern architecture. Built between 1908 and 1910, it is here at the Roby House where Frank Lloyd Wright made the open plan concept an integral part of his organic architecture. In this later prairie style home, Wright eliminated the walls between the living and dining rooms. They are divided only by a central chimney to create a single expansive space for domestic family life. The casement art glass windows and French doors whose patterns of diagonal geometries in the art glass evoke the natural fauna and allow entry to sweeping porches on the south, east, and west sides of the room, extending the interior into the garden. Slatted vertical screens surround the staircase and an original dining set with high back chairs allowed Wright to create an intimate, private space for the Roby family and friends within the otherwise open room. Wright wanted to reduce the rooms in a house to the barest essentials, to have these spaces be free flowing and to unify the indoors with the outdoors. Hi, welcome to Taliesin. My name is Ryan Houston. I'm the director of preservation. We're excited to we're excited to celebrate these eight UNESCO World Heritage sites. I'm here at the Hill Crown at Taliesin to talk about how Wright married this building into its natural surroundings. Wright was familiar with this Hill Crown since he was a boy, and he decided to make Taliesin of the hill, not on it. And as you can see as well from here, that the roof lines are sympathetic to the rolling hills beyond. Um, also, Wright uses a material palette that's sympathetic to the area by using uh, cedar shingles that naturally gray, as well as limestone that was quarried less than a quarter of a mile away from the site. This helps the building feel like it rises out of the, out of the site, not merely placed on top of it. Uh, Wright even was led to, even said that during the winter when the snow sweeps up on the eaves, it looks like the, uh, the house looks like the hill itself. And um, due to Wright's thoughtful consideration of materials and location of the building, 
the house and hill look as if they've always been together. Hollyhock House is a modern interpretation of indigenous forms from the region, while retaining key features of its earlier work, such as strong horizontal lines and innovative spatial arrangements, the architect embraced the freedom and natural beauty of California. For every interior space at Hollyhock House, there's a corresponding outdoor one. Rooms open out onto picturesque courtyards, rooftop terraces are important living spaces. And these features become synonymous with California modernism, taken up by Wright protégés like Rudolf Schindler, who first came to Los Angeles to work on Hollyhock House. In designing for the region, Wright looked to pre-Hispanic structures. He evoked rather than imitated Maya architecture with his designs here. The canted upper walls with pronounced eaves resemble those of the Palace of Palenque in Southern Mexico. The decorative stonework also relates to the dense patterning of Maya facades that the architect admired. Wright also borrowed from other regional precedents. While he characterized Southern California's colonial revival architecture as tawdry Spanish medievalism, he couldn't resist incorporating a Spanish-style courtyard at the center of Hollyhock House. The integration of livable roof terraces draws on native Pueblo building traditions as well. While Wright may have taken general forms from cultures before, he made the designs for Hollyhock House distinctly his own. Motifs here certainly don't replicate anything seen in the Yucatan. Hi, I'm Justin Gunther, the director of Falling Water, and we're excited to celebrate the anniversary of the inscription to the UNESCO World Heritage List of the 20th century architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. Falling Water was designed by Wright in 1935 for the Kaufman family of Pittsburgh and is regarded as one of Wright's seminal examples of his philosophy of organic architecture, where Wright was trying to create a seamless interaction between human habitation and the natural world. And here at Falling Water, Wright's able to achieve a unified design because he bases the entire inspiration in nature's forms and principles. So the limited palette of colors, materials, and design motifs that he uses throughout the architecture, both inside and out, is all taken from the native woodland landscape here, all inspired by what we see in the setting around us. And by doing so, by uniting inside and outside space with these reiterated concepts, he creates a unified composition that is uniquely tied to its setting. And I think that's most easily seen and best illustrated just by looking at the overall form of the house, the building itself. So like the rushing water and the waterfalls, the house is a cascade. The way it steps down the hillside site, the way it ends in soaring cantilevers over the rock ledges of the waterfall. Wright takes primary inspiration from the main feature of the natural landscape translates it into dramatic sculptural three-dimensional space and thus ties the building to its site. And I think too, if you look at the overall form, Wright's paying reverence to the old growth forest, to the trees in the landscape. The central stone tower is like a giant vertical tree trunk. And then reaching out from it are the smooth floating cantilevers and slabs of reinforced concrete. And then to further tie the whole composition to the site, all of the rock of the walls was quarried directly from the site, laid up in uneven rough patterns to mimic the natural rock strata found in the landscape, giving this, this appearance that the house is growing up out of native rock. So all of these ideas give Falling Water its outstanding universal value. They make Falling Water Wright's tour de force. It's his response, his reaction to the machine age aesthetic of the international style. But here at Falling Water, he does it in a much more humanistic, site-specific, natural, organic way. And even though he's embracing the fundamentals of modern design, he's pushing them in totally new directions in truly beautiful, unique ways that continue to inspire us to this day. Welcome to the Herbert and Catherine Jacobs house, Frank Lloyd Wright's first built Usonian style house. 
The house was designed in 1936, built in 1937, and revolutionized American domestic architecture in the mid 20th century. Wright eliminated all walls between the living room, dining room, and kitchen, essentially borrowing space from each room to make the total live much larger than the small 1,400 square foot footprint. He also increased the livability of these spaces by raising the roof and making the ceilings much higher to increase the feeling of spaciousness. This is most evident in the small kitchen with its highest ceiling of the house. Wright turned the houses back to the street to increase the privacy, but also opened the back of the house up to encourage outside living in the large double lot. Thank you for visiting the Herbert and Catherine Jacobs house. Hello and welcome to Taliesin West. I'm Fred Prezillo, Vice President of Preservation for the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. And today we are celebrating the anniversary of our inscription uh, as a World Heritage Site, UNESCO World Heritage Site. One of the amazing things about Taliesin West is uh, the procession through which you move through the site. Wright created these interconnected pathways uh, that move you through so you really experience the buildings in a wonderful way, setting up pathways that look off into the distance off the property, connecting you to the mountains surrounding the site, to the valley. Uh, so it really makes for an impressive uh, movement through Taliesin West, uh, really connecting you not only to the buildings here, but to the greater landscape, celebrating Taliesin West as an amazing building here in this desert Southwest. So as you enter Taliesin West, you pass Frank Lloyd Wright's office, where you might often first stop and greet and meet with Frank Lloyd Wright. And then you enter into the property, first arriving into this little court, which uh, really then starts uh, to present different options to move through Taliesin West. You can move out onto the prowl, which was kind of a communal space fellowship here at Johnson West. Uh, looking out over the valley, this commanding view, which Wright termed, you know, like standing on the edge of the world, looking out over the universe. Uh, he loved that amazing view. Uh, and then, you know, you move through the site, move around the prow to his private quarters, or you could come up uh, this way and head down what we call the pergola. It's the main circulation spine and West. Uh, moving down that pathway, you could enter into the studio, into the kitchen and the dining room, and then private spaces. Um, and then here, you can lead you up a couple of flights of steps to the garden squares where they would gather. And he creates this amazing vignette, this amazing composition where, you know, he takes you into this lower court, he raises you up a few steps with the fountain, creating a beautiful space to gather around the fountain. Takes you up a few more steps to the garden squares, uh, layering the scene with the garden squares, the citrus grove behind the garden squares, the mountain and the sky, you know, setting everything up like a Japanese print, the prints that he loved so much. So these are just a couple of examples of how Wright leads you through Taliesin West and why we think it's such an amazing space and why uh, the world, uh, UNESCO, believe we are worthy of inscription as a World Heritage Site. Thanks for sharing a moment with us. We hope to see you sometime soon out here at Talia Sun West.
opened to the public on October 21st, 1959, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum became one of the most important and iconic buildings of Frank Lloyd Wright's late career. The unique architecture of the space, with its spiral ramp riding to a domed skylight, is a temple of spirit, a monument where art and architecture feed off of one another in captivating ways. The Guggenheim also represents Wright's understanding of what a great public building should do, standing out from its environment and challenging the idea of the vertical surface. With its organic form and curving shape, the Guggenheim stands as a sculptural object that goes against the conventionality of New York's rectilinear format. Wright has created an innovative work that redefines how we normally think of architecture and also provides a unique forum for the public to enjoy contemporary art. Today, the museum continues to be an internationally renowned destination that caters to the public's ever-evolving interest in art and architecture.